All of you are familiar with the eschatological sermon of Jesus Christ, uh, the private sermon with his disciples in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, speaking of the future events, what we're waiting for, destiny of Jerusalem and the nation which rejected him as Messiah. And also speaking of uh, our days, making the comparison, uh, Jesus saying, as it was in the day days of Noah, so it will be in the days before the Son of Man would come. Jesus mentioned, uh, let us read from Matthew chapter 24, verse, from verse 37 to 42. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore. The similar words we find also in uh, Luke chapter 17 from verses 30 to 36. <coughs> Jesus said that before the Son of Man will come, two people which were doing the same job, having the same occupation, living in the si same household. Because in Luke it even mentions... Uh, Verse, Luke 17, ch uh, uh, chapter 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. And uh, then also repeats that uh, two women uh, grinding in uh, the same meal, and two men shall be in the field, one is taken, and the other is left. How come the two people in the same bed, husband and wife, one is taken, the other left. Two women doing the same work, were grinding at the mill, or to, if to make a comparison to our days, do, going to the same college, or two people being in the field, two Bible workers working in the same field, one is taken, the other is left. Two men singing in the same choir, two sisters doing the same work at the church, preparing meals after divine service. One is taken and the other is left. How can it be that some people from the church will be taken and from the very same church some people will be left out? It's, it's a scary prophecy, but this is the reality. Even among the twelve disciples, there was one found not worthy. And when we see through the history that many, like kings of Israel, one was worthy, another was not worthy. And it says, and he did as his father David did. He was righteous before the Lord. But his son was not like his father David, and he was not doing righteous, but he was doing all the sins of Manasseh or somebody repeating the sins of somebody. And saying one was good, another was bad. Father was good, son was bad. Or the other, the father was bad, but his son was good and doing all the righteous, and he uh, renovated the temple, and he restarted the service in the temple. But Jesus comes to even closer. It says two people sleeping, sharing the same bed, husband and wife. How can it be that one is saved, the other is not? Let me ask you a question. When in the Old Testament, 
a person not to be killed by God in a day of atonement in order to survive that day of judgment, what a person had to do before that day? Their sins had to be transferred to, to the sanctuary. Now, let me ask you, let's say, uh, let's speak of an older time. There is a family, Jewish family, they have, let's say, three children, husband and wife. And the husband, he was faithful, he was helping the strangers, never pressing widow, giving offerings, giving extra offerings, like a spirit of prophecy says that some of them were giving not tithes and second tithes, but a quarter of their income. He is faithful with the Sabbath, and he keeps his children in obedience. And in a day of atonement, his wife and children survive, and he is dead. How can it happen? As something little sin, unconfessed, remained on him, and it was not transferred to the sanctuary through confession. Do you realize what danger we are facing? How can it be that in the same family one can be lost, one is saved? And it's not speaking of a separated family where a husband is in the world, he is against uh, the wife's religion and he is mocking her and she is suffering. No, it's talking of family, of a Christian family where husband and wife are members of the church sharing the same beliefs going in the same direction, but one is reaching the destination and the other is lost. Let me bring you a couple, couple, couple illustrations. I will generate a couple uh, possible life situations so you, to be more pr to have you, that you may see a practical application of all this. Let's say there is some misunderstanding between husband and wife. So the husband says, you know what, that's what you did was wrong. And the wife replies, yes, but what you did yesterday was also wrong. So you do even more wrong than I do. And when finally husband proves that the wife is not right at this moment, she's in tears. You know, there is a saying that says, I understand that it's my fault, but at least, can you say sorry? Now, let's say this, the story went on, I mean, the, 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 the situation was forgotten, forgotten, and uh, the time is passing. Then the Holy Communion comes, and then another Holy Communion comes. And then the end of the year comes, the week of prayer comes, where the week of prayer and reconciliation, a prayer and confession. And that particular sin was never admitted by wife, and she never asked, I'm sorry. What will happen with that sin? That sin remains on her. It's not transferred upon Jesus. That sin is not transferred to the heavenly sanctuary through confession. And the life goes on. Or the same situation, the husband. A, a situation that he did something wrong. He offended his wife. And then he pretends like nothing happens. And because she loves him, she forgives and forgets. And the life goes on. But he never said, I'm sorry for the situation he created. Was his sin forgiven? No. The Bible is very clear. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess. Now you see, I, I brought you just a basic uh, possible situations in a family. That how often we, because we love someone or because we don't want to escalate the conflict, just forget it, you know, everything is okay, you know, just move on. Yeah, we may say move on and we can move on. But unless person confess the sin, what happens with that sin? Remains upon person and what was what was the destiny of a person whose sin was not transferred and was not taken by a scapegoat in a day of atonement the Bible is very clear that soul will will be cut off from the people of God what if husband or wife or son or daughter has a secret sin, something that parents don't know, something that the wife doesn't know, something that husband doesn't know. And because it's a secret sin, we have fear to forgive, to confess. And out of that fear, we lose our soul. So what is more fearful, fearless? What are you most afraid of if you compare losing eternity or maybe losing trust, losing life or maybe having uh, unpleasant situation with the discussion and uh, all the follow up? Some people choose to lose eternity but not to escalate the problem. How many times people in the church cannot forgive, cannot forget, or don't ask for forgiveness? I would like to read from the Steps of Christ, page 38. True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins they may be of such a nature as to be brought before God only so if it was something secret that nobody was involved nobody was offended by that sin you don't have to make that public so as they uh, as such a nature as to be brought before God only they might be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who have suffered injury through them. How can we injure an individual? How about without words? Can we injure an individual without words? Attitude. Attitude. I remember it was back in Ukraine. There was one brother, and they were gathering uh, people, young people, for the choir. And uh, somebody was, Brother Gennady, how about that brother? And I just made. But he saw that. And then he. He approached me and told me in my face, says, how can you do that? You know, I thought you're my friend. You see, because we are not, we don't have courage to be honest, says, no, he, brother, even if you're cold, you cannot sing. You know, don't be offended, but that's not your gift. But <laughs> pretending, pretending that you're a friend and secretly behind his back saying, don't call him because he cannot sing. What is that? Hypocrisy. Without words, we may offend or injure a person. What is true confession in this situation? 
to ask for forgiveness. Brother, I'm sorry. I did really wrong. Please forgive me. Particular, not, brother, yes, you know what? We all have faults. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Let's forgive one another. Is that a confession? No. no. What is the true repentance? Brother, forgive me for doing that particular th thing. Or they may, may be speaking, I'm continuing of our sins, or they may be of a public character, our sins, and should then be as publicly confessed. But listen carefully. But all confession should be definite and to the point, acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty. We cannot say, brother, I remember there was a story. And uh, also, back in Ukraine, my father remembers that story. There was one brother, and as my brother, my father was going to visit some people, he, they were tra traveling together in a car. He says, you know, brother Victor, you know, that such and such a brother, you know, told such and such a things about you. My father just, okay, I'll talk to that brother. You know, that's what was his thinking. Then uh, the other brother, when he was traveling with the very same man, saying, you know, Brother Victor said such and such a thing about you. And that brother comes to my father and says, Brother, how could you say such a thing? He says, how could you say such a thing? I didn't say. And he says, I didn't say. Then they call the brother. Brother, you said, and the other brother, brother, you said, he looked at us and says, brothers, I forgive you. He turned and walked away. <laughs> It's a true story. Sometimes we do such a confessions. Because the Holy Communion approaches, well father, well mother, well son, well brother, sister, whoever, friend, well forgive me. For what? If you feel something, say, forgive me for that and that and that. But all confessions should be definite and to the point, acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty. And if we skip doing that at this Holy Communion, and we skip at the following, and as we skip at the end of the year, the week of prayer, then another year comes, and then we skip, and we forget about it. But we have to understand, it's not forgotten in heaven. Everything is recorded. And one day, we will have to face those records. A clean page, everything washed by the blood of Jesus, and the Jesus will show, you see, it's clean. Or Jesus will show us a list of records. Maybe everything clean, but one unconfessed. How many things, how many things we have to do to die? We don't, don't have to do anything to die. We are doomed from the beginning, from the very beginning. The moment we appear on this planet Earth, we are about to die. And what it takes to have life eternal. Bring everything to Jesus. A confession. If you offended, if you injured someone, you have to confess to that person. It's not your business if that person forgives you. Your business is to be specific in your confession. We have to understand it's a very serious one, Jesus said. One is taken, another is left. From the same family, sharing the same bed, doing the same work, working in the same building, in the same office, going to the same college, playing in the same orchestra. One is taken, another is left. Why? How many times you approach a person and you try to be polite brother or sister 
this is, I don't think this is right, what you do. And you try to be, just look at yourself. And they, they uh, you feel like, you know, that they are surrounded with the uh, atmosphere of rejection. You try your best. You try to, to correct a person and you feel they are rejecting. And then we'll come to heaven and we will look for those people and we will not find them there. But we will find in heaven somebody else of whom we, will, we never thought that it will be in heaven. Why? You know, there is Apostle Paul has this uh, saying that they are saved like plucked from the fire in the last moment. You know, like a, when you drop a piece of a paper in the fire and then you realize it's important and you just grab it from the fire and, and you try to extinguish a fire to save the text, the information. That's somehow people are saved. Some people will be saved that way. And we never expect to see them in heaven. And they will be among those who is taken and those people of whom we thought good person will be left, not taken to heaven. Why? Because that person in the very last moment, like a thief on the cross, realized that they need Jesus. And everything they have, all their wicked life, they gave it they, to Jesus. And Jesus took care of it in, in a moment. His life, faithful Sabbath keeper, faithful vegan, tithe payer, Something they could not, they didn't have courage to say, I'm sorry. And they are not taken. To finalize this point in this study, I would like to read from Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now, help me to remember as some individuals from Bible who were casting out devils and doing miracles in the power of the Lord. Judas. Hmm? Judas, Judas. How about those 70 disciples? Mm -hmm. Were they casting devils? Mm -hmm. And they will come. Lord, you remember, we were your followers, we were casting out devils. But Jesus said, what will be the reply of Jesus? You never ate of my body, you never drank of my blood. Because that's what the words, that what uh, caused them to go away. You remember when Jesus said, those who will eat of my flesh and drink of my blood will have life eternal. And what they say, oh, what a... Words, you know, we, no, 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 that's, that's beyond. And they left. What that proved? There was no broken heart in them. When you love your wife, and she says something, which can be understand, to be understood, you know, in both ways. I can understand it as offensive, or I can understand that maybe she meant something else. What do I do? What do you mean? I ask, what do you mean? If I'm looking for a reason to play offended, I pretend that I did not understood that it could be interpreted the other side, and I play offended. Has it happened in our life? That we pretend like we do not understood that it can be applied the other side, the other way? with our relationship between husband, wife, brothers, sisters, that we pretend that we didn't get it and we pray offended? What is that? Who has to say sorry now? No, not my wife. That's my pride makes me be offended. Who has to say sorry? 
You see? If the deeper you go, the closer you come to Jesus, those things which you didn't realize before, you will realize that the things you were blaming other people before, you will realize that it's your fault. That's, brothers, what we need. We need to come to Jesus. As Isaiah, as we studied in the Sabbath school, when he met the Lord, he realized that he is no better than those wicked people who are corrupted and take land by land and steal and bribe and, and commit adultery and do everything. He is no better than them. Because pretending to be righteous, seeing myself in a good condition, is worse than being that wicked. They do their wicked life and they enjoy their wickedness. I neither do and neither enjoy the wickedness what they do, but neither have peace of mind. You understand that those people, at least they have some temporary joy in those things what they do, gambling or uh, prostitution, whatever. They, for a moment, they have a kind of a gladness in their life. How many reformers, their life, they don't have a joy in their life? Why? Neither we, uh, consciously, we cannot enjoy that wicked life. But neither we have peace of mind. Why? We need an experience of Isaiah. Otherwise, we will be left. My wife, my children will be saved. I will be left. If something I have to confess, if something I remember, somebody was injured by me, and I will never do and approach that person with my confession, that sin will kill me. Little. But it will be enough to kill me. Because simply it will not be blotted out. When we read of uh, those who will go through the Jacob's trouble in a time of great tribulation, what will be their battle in their mind? Is anything left that I did not confess. And they say they couldn't remember. Why they couldn't remember that day that, I mean, they, they were searching, they were going day by day in their life and re remembering all the situations, all the discussions with wife, with children, with brothers, sisters, at work, at school. And they will not find anything that they were guilty and they did not say, I'm sorry. Because every time they were guilty, they were saying, they were asking for forgiveness. And they, they will find nothing unconfessed because everything was confessed. What will happen to the other class of people who were also believers, faithful Christian, and says they will not be able, if you read in Great Controversy, to go through the time of trouble time of trouble it says their desperation the state of mind will be so heavy heavily a burden upon their conscience that it will smash them they simply will not go through that time they won't be able because they have no no secure and they will be not protected by heavenly angels and they will be smashed. The final conclusion. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My wish and prayer. I want to be taken. I want all of you to be taken. And but we have to remember, that's my wish. I won't be taken, my wife, my mother, father, my mother and father-in-law, and my children, and my relatives, and my uncle, and my cousins, 
I want all of my family to be taken. Then I want all of you to be taken. Yes, I'm egoistic. You see, I want my family first and then you. <laughs> but the reality is what Jesus said, one will be taken, another left. Therefore, there is no time to look at others. There is no a single second to worry about your sins or about defects of my wife. There is only short time left to think of my own salvation. Amen.